Well, good morning. Welcome to the gathering of Castleview Church. My name is Tony. I'm one of the members here at Castleview. Uh, please make your way in and take your seat. Um, I have a few announcements before we begin our worship service today. Uh, the first, I want to remind you of our evenings together. At 5.30 every evening, we gather in this room and have a prayer service, a brief time of teaching from God's Word. Uh, it feels like a more intimate family gathering. So if you've not had the opportunity to join us for our Sunday evening services, 5.30 tonight, please uh, feel free to join us for that. Um, I'd also like you to make aware that we have a Castleview 101 class uh, that's beginning October 16th. And if you're not aware of what Castleview 101 is, it sounds academic, uh, but really it's a getting to know us type of meeting, and it's several meetings over the course of several Sunday mornings. It takes place at 9 o'clock during the Sunday school hour, and so starting October 16th, uh, you can meet down in the, the adult Sunday school wing uh, at 9 o'clock starting October 16th, and it'll be consecutive Sundays for several weeks. Uh, it is uh, something to take advantage of to become a member of Castleview, but even if you're not ready for that next step, but just want to know what is this church about? What do we believe? How is it structured? Uh, that would be the, a really great formal way to get to know our church here. Uh, lastly, I'd like to draw your attention uh, to different ways that you can give to this church. We are run on uh, donations, so we can be grateful to the Lord that the lights are on, the air conditioning is going, um, and that's no small thing. Uh, so that is done based on your contributions to this church. Uh, you can look in your pew in front of you is one way to give is to use these envelopes uh, to deposit cash or checks. Uh, those can be dropped in boxes that are located at the back of the worship center and also in the lobby. You can find boxes on the wall. Uh, maybe an easier way to give is to give online. If you go to castleview.org slash give, uh, you can make contributions online as well. Well, as we begin our time of worship, let's quiet our hearts and praise our God who loves us. This is Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. This morning you will hear of God's love as a refrain throughout the service. From the songs that we sing uh, and also in the picture of baptism that we're going to see today. And in the preaching that we hear, we're going to hear about God's love over and over. Uh, one of our verses that we're about to sing says, Let thy goodness like a fetter, which means shackle, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Our hearts are fickle, but God's love is faithful. Let's stand and sing together. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, Sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Hitherto thy love has blessed me. Thou hast brought me to this place, and I know thy hand will bring me safely home by thy good grace. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, 
bought me with his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Oh, that day when freed from sinning, I shall see thy lovely face full arrayed in blood washed linen how i'll sing thy sovereign grace come my lord no longer tarry bring thy promises to pass for i know thy power will keep me till i'm home with thee at last how deep the father's love for us how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this 
this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Why should I gain? Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Amen. You may be seated. Well, if our faith is in Christ, then we have gained from his reward. If our trust is in his sacrifice, then his wounds have paid our ransom. If we are in Christ, then it is no fearful thing for us to confess our sins. Andy McNeely comes now to lead us in a prayer of confession. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we humbly come before you alone, the Lord of lords, because in the beginning you created heaven and earth. Throughout history, you have sustained the world and are sovereign over all that happens in it. From your word, we know you made all this evident to us. Since the creation of the world, your invisible attributes, your eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. They've been understood by what has been made so that we are without excuse when we don't see it. Too often, even though we know you, we do not honor you as God or give you our thanks. We take for granted that the sun will rise each morning, light our world throughout the day, and that it will set every evening. We don't think about how the moon and stars should remind us of your continuing presence through the night. You freed us from slavery to sin and from your wrath by the sacrificial blood of your only son. By grace, Jesus paid the price to redeem us as your children. He did it even while we were still your enemies. As believers, we all too often fall into the rut of even taking all of that for granted. Please forgive us. When we suffer under poor leadership in areas of our life, we too often complain and get anxious and lean on our own understanding rather than Coming to you with prayer and thanksgiving, we forfeit our access to your peace that surpasses all of our own understanding. Please guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Father, you remember us when we are suffering from poor health in our own life and the reality of sickness and death in our families. We need your comfort and love more than we even know. We don't reach out to those you have put around us that can help. Thank you for our church family. You feed and nourish our flesh when we are hungry. Give us water when we are thirsty. In the same way, you feed our souls and quench our spiritual thirst for your love. We give thanks to you, our God of heaven, because your steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Well, amen. We admit our sin, but we have hope because of God's steadfast love for us in Christ. Church, will you please stand with me as we read from Psalm 136. If you look in your bulletin uh, on page three and four, there's, the reading is there. Uh, I'll read the first part of each verse and I'd like you to please read in unison the bold refrain. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters. His steadfast love endures forever. To him who made the great lights. For his steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day. For his steadfast 
past love endures forever. The moon and stars to rule over the night. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt. For his steadfast love endures forever. And brought Israel out from among them. For his steadfast love endures forever. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea in two. For his steadfast love endures forever. And made Israel pass through the midst of it. For his steadfast love endures forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host into the Red Sea. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who struck down great kings. Steadfast love endures forever. And killed mighty kings. For his steadfast love endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites. For his steadfast love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan. For his steadfast love endures forever. And gave their land as a heritage. For his steadfast love endures forever. A heritage to Israel, his servant. It is he who remembered us in our low estate. For his steadfast love endures forever. And rescued us from our foes. For his steadfast love endures forever. He who gives food to all flesh. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to God of heaven. For his steadfast love endures forever. Please remain standing as we sing to the Lord together. All praise to him, the God of light, who formed the mountains by his might. All praise to him who names the stars that sing his fame in skies afar. All praise to him who reigns in love, who guides the galaxies above, yet bends to ear our every prayer with sovereign power and tender care. All praise to him whose love is seen in Christ the Son, the Servant King, who left behind his glorious throne to pay the ransom for his own. All praise to him who humbly came to bear our sorrow, sin, and shame, who lived to die, who died to rise, the all-sufficient sacrifice. All praise to him whose power imparts the love of God within our hearts, the spirit of all truth and peace, the fount of joy and holiness. To Father, Son, and Spirit now, our souls we lift, our wills we bow to you the triune god we raise with loving hearts our song of praise to father son to father son and spirit now our souls we lift our wills we bow to you the triune god we raise with loving hearts our 
our song of praise. Continue to worship God by bringing our request to him in prayer. Would you pray with me? Almighty creator, gracious father, we've already considered so many reasons we have to love you because of your goodness, your faithfulness, your steadfast love to us. We see that love in Christ and in his sacrifice for us, his resurrection and the resurrection life he now gives to us by your spirit. It's because of these things that with confidence that you'll hear us, not because we deserve it, but because Christ stands before you on our behalf. So hear our prayers, meet our needs, we pray. We look around our world and we see so much brokenness, we see so much evil. We see children in our communities who are neglected, who are unloved who are not cared for by parents, Lord, we pray that you would have mercy. We think of the thousands in this city alone affected by uh, parents who are not there for their children, for those who are in the foster care system. We pray that you'd have mercy, that you would help parents to provide what they need to provide for their children. We pray for the children who are in dire straits, that you would show yourself to be the father of the fatherless. We pray that you would use uh, social workers and others to help them and protect them. We pray especially for ministries and, and parents to step up and to meet these needs. Lord, we pray for the leaders you put in place over us. You tell us to pray for those in authority, so we do. We pray for Senator Todd Young and Mike Braun, for Representative Victoria Sparks. Thank you for public servants like these. We pray that you would bless them and give them health and strength and clarity to lead for the good of the people they serve. We ask that you would align their desires and their actions with your ways, with your wisdom. We pray that the people under them would prosper because of their leadership. Father, we're so thankful that we get to not only receive a glorious salvation in Christ, but we can be used by you to spread the good news of what Christ has done, that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is a Savior who loves to redeem sinners like us. We thank you for how that message is going out throughout the world. Thank you for our partnership with Michael and Kanan Granger in Ethiopia. We pray for continued uh, faithfulness and fruitfulness for their young church as they've been without Michael, their pastor, these past couple of weeks. We pray that you would raise up future leaders and pastors. Lord, we pray for uh, the Grangers right now as they mourn the loss of Michael Sr. We pray that you would comfort them, that you would be their refuge and their strength. You'd be their ever-present help in trouble. For all the family, we pray that they would be drawn to you, that they would be assured of your love, that they would put their hope again in Christ. Lord, we thank you for the spread of the gospel, not only globally, but also locally. Thank you for the Fields Church, a new church family in Westfield, for Jeff Strickland. We pray that as he preaches from Matthew 5 this morning about Christ and how he fulfills the law and the prophets, uh, that that church family would leave rejoicing in Christ. We pray that as a young church family, there would be deep relationships that are forming, that they would encourage one another and challenge one another and help each other to follow Christ. Lord, we pray that the same would be happening here among us at Castleview. We thank you for all the things you're doing among us. We celebrate the gift of new life, physically, new biological life, new uh, babies being born. We thank you for Baby Jet, born to Jake and Tina. And baby Tobias, born to Jarrett and Laura. Lord, we pray that these 
young lives would be protected and nurtured. We pray that they would come to saving faith in Christ. We pray that their parents would have patience and love for them that is reflective of the love that we receive from you, our Heavenly Father. We pray that you'd give them energy and strength and health in these early days and weeks. Give them wisdom in knowing how best to love and care for and raise these children in the fear and instruction of the Lord. We pray that you'd help us as a church family, as we promised to do in our covenant, to help bring them up, these children that have been entrusted to the care of their parents, the parents who are members of our church, that we would encourage them and help them and hold them accountable to be loving parents. We pray this not only for uh, parents to children, but for all of the relationships within our church family, that love would be characteristic of our lives and our relationships and our interactions that we would value love as you do, that we would see it as important, that it's something we would pursue, that we would love more and more like Christ. Lord, as we turn to your word in a few minutes, we pray that you would take this word that you tell us is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword, that it would pierce to the division of soul and spirit of joints and of marrow, that it would discern the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. You tell us that no creature is hidden from your sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Lord, we humbly acknowledge that. And so we pray in light of that coming day that you would, in your mercy, speak to us and change us this day. You give us hearts to trust and love you and then to love one another. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Before the message this morning, we sing once again of the love of God shown to us in Jesus Christ. Let's stand and sing out together. Loving kindness as the flood When the prince of life our ransom Shed for us his precious blood Who is love will not remember Who can cease to sing his praise He will never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days. On the mount of crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide. Through the floodgates of God's mercy Float a vast and gracious tide Grace and love like mighty rivers Poured incessant from above And heaven's peace and perfect justice Kiss the guilty world in love. That same love beyond all measure, mocked and slain by hateful men, lives and reigns in resurrection. And can never die again Here is love for all the ages Radiant sun of heaven he stands Call 
calling home his father's children, holding forth his wounded hands. Let me all your truth accepting, love you ever all my days let me seek your kingdom only and my life be to your praise you alone shall be my glory nothing in the world i see you have cleansed and sanctified me you yourself have set me free amen please be seated One uh, common icebreaker that I'm sure you've answered before is if you could have one superpower, what would you choose? Got all the classic superpowers like flight, superhuman strength, superhuman speed, seeing through walls. You say, well, why do we like to think about these things? What is it that's so fun about imagining having powers like these? We could say, well, I mean, it's... It's amazing to think how I could help others. Okay, sure, that's true. But most of the time, that's probably not what we're thinking of. Maybe we're thinking about the experience of flying through the air. That sounds exciting. Maybe we're also thinking a little bit about how amazing it would be to be able to see the reaction of other people. How we would be impressing them. When I was younger, my daydreams were not about any of those superpowers, but just about being able to dunk a basketball. And uh, that was about as far out of reach as flying through the air for me. But it was something that I imagined sometimes, more often than I would have liked to admit, and I imagine mostly the response from other people at a playground or in a gym when all of a sudden out of the blue during a basketball game, I just jumped over somebody and dunked it. That was my dream, people gathering around to watch, saying, oh my goodness, did you see this guy? And the crowd forms. That's the stuff that our dreams and our fantasies are often made of. And maybe that's more of a childhood dream as we grow into adulthood. We don't daydream about superhuman abilities or athletic feats like that. But we often think about acquiring greater abilities, don't we? We often dream about how we could be better, how we could be stronger. Usually most of that it still comes down to a focus on self, self-development. We like to think about and talk about self-improvement. What can I achieve? What can I contribute? How can I prove my worth? How can I impress others? And maybe sometimes we would even, though, again, we might not want to admit it, We would even think about God or religion as a means to help me be the best, most accomplished version of myself. Think about sometimes even as Christians when we are asked for how to pray and we ask for wisdom. That's a good thing to ask for. The Bible tells us to ask for wisdom. A good thing to pray for. But sometimes it could be that my desire for wisdom is really me just longing to have insight so that I could make the best decisions possible. Why? So that the results that I want come to be. Desires like wanting to be happy, wanting to be impressive or popular or wealthy or respected. That's what I'm bothered by, that I'm not those things. And so I want wisdom to make right decisions so that these things will happen and I'll feel better. Our selfish pursuit can even have that kind of pious sounding frame to it. You say, Lord, I I need you. Help me. I feel so weak. 
which is good so far, but sometimes I might mean by that, I need your help to get what I'm after. I need your help to be the person that I want to be. But so often when we encounter the God of the Bible, the one that maybe we're hoping will help us get to where we want to go, he, instead of helping us get where we want to go, he redirects us entirely. I mean, this happens over and over again, like when the disciples are arguing about who's the greatest or when James and John are, are asking about, I mean, could we maybe sit at your right and your left, Jesus, in your kingdom? What does Jesus say? He says, you guys are pointed in the wrong direction. Right? You're, you're reaching up when you should be kneeling down, stooping to become lower. If you want to be great in the way that I define greatness, you have to be a servant. You have to be slave of all. God often tells us in the scriptures, you are aimed at the wrong goal. The problem then in those situations is not that you need his strength to accomplish your dreams. You actually need different dreams. Different things that you're after. Things that line up with what God cares most about. Now we've already seen in this letter of 1 Corinthians uh, how this can be true even in the church. For these Christians in Corinth, perhaps for some of us, the church became just another arena in which they could perform. Just another context to be impressive and to raise your standing in the eyes of other people. That's why they longed for powerful spiritual gifts that would show off their greatness. And we saw in chapter 12 how Paul said, no, you're thinking about this all wrong. You are the body of Christ. These gifts come from the spirit to every member of the body and every member is indispensable. It's not about being better than others. It's about giving and receiving within the body. The members that you look down on are actually indispensable parts of the body. And next week when we go on to chapter 14, he's going to expand on the purpose of these spiritual gifts, which is to build up the body of Christ. And sandwiched here in the middle, he shows us that love is the bedrock. Love is essential for living in this way and seeing the world and the church in this way. In 1 Corinthians 13, one of the most famous chapters of the Bible, you hear it at weddings for good reason. It's, it's beautiful writing, but more than that, it is divine redirection for Christians who in so many ways get focused again on self, focused again on personal abilities. For everyone who wants to maximize their potential, their self-realization, or even we could say our public ministry, Paul says, let me show you a better way. That's how he ended chapter 12, which really kicks off this section, I will show you a still more excellent way, which we come to find out is the way of love. It's the main point of this sermon, which I think lines up with the main point of this passage. Christ-like, selfless love is better than impressive gifts. Christ-like, selfless love is better than impressive gifts. Or we could add, than anything else, we might be tempted to overvalue. What is it that you're after this morning? What is it that you care about that you want so much? Christ-like, selfless love is better. Let's read the whole chapter together. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge... And if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. 
As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Two main headings this morning. The value of love and the character of love. The value of love we see in the first and third paragraphs. And then in between, verses 4 to 7, we're going to come back and look at the character of love. First, the value of love. Verses 1 through 3, we see that love is essential. The most impressive gifts and abilities that you can imagine are worthless if not accompanied by love. Verse 1, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. He starts off with the gift of tongues, an impressive gift, and the one that apparently the Corinthians were most eager to have, most eager to display because it was so impressive. And Paul uses hyperbole here. He says, let's say I can speak not only in human languages, but I can speak the language of, of angels. You want tongues? You want to speak in other languages? Imagine speaking in every language that there is. How impressive that would be. He says, but if I don't have love, I am just like a loud crashing of cymbals. If you have gifts like this, you might be impressed with yourself. But it won't be a blessing to anyone. Like a noisy banging, clanging sound. That's tongues. That's impressive gifts without love. What can we say about noisy clanging of cymbals? It's pointless. It doesn't accomplish anything. It's abrasive. It's annoying. Verse 2. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries, all knowledge... And if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. He moves on to other spiritual gifts here, prophecy and faith. Prophecy, reminder from chapter 12, was the result of divine revelation where an individual understood something that had been unknown. God brings it to light and then that person relays it to others. But again, here he uses hyperbole. Prophecy was God revealing some knowledge, some mystery, But imagine a prophecy where you understand all mysteries and you have all knowledge. Imagine having the right answer for every question. That's a superpower I could get excited about. People come to you, they're going to come and and they are stumped by something in life, in the Bible, some theological question. And after centuries and millennia of people wrestling with it, You're the one who can pierce through the darkness and shed light on it. And people say, wow, oh, that's so good. He's so wise. He adds the gift of faith there. He says, you have such pronounced faith that you can literally move mountains. You're like, wait, what happened? There used to be a mountain right there. Yeah, Paul moved it. Paul moved it. He just has that kind of faith. Wow, unbelievable says, if I can do all this, but I don't have love, I may think I'm something, other people may be impressed, but in reality, in God's eyes, I am nothing. Verse 3, if I give away all that I have, I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Now here he shifts a little bit from impressive gifts to impressive sacrifice. I give away all that I own to the poor. I heroically lay down my life. Maybe some of you, I think especially if you're male, this might be true of you. You have had this kind of daydream about saving other people's lives heroically. And there's something good in this, this desire to sacrifice for the good of others. But often, again, those 
daydreams can give way to self-glory. Maybe in that vision, you're the, you're the humble hero, but other people can't help but sing your praises. It says, even if you live like this, even if you give away everything, lay down your own life, but don't have love, you gain nothing. God does not reward loveless sacrifices. Now, I think we see in this one truth about love. Love starts on the inside. It is seen in lived out actions. But it must start within. It must be the thing that motivates those actions. It should drive all that we do. All right, so love is not just another list on our spiritual uh, to-do list. Not just another item. Did you read your Bible check? Did you uh, pray check? Did you remember to love someone? Oh, no, I'll get to that this afternoon. It's not just another thing that we just do in isolation. It is to motivate and to drive all that we do. It's to be the heart behind our words and our actions and even our sacrifices. Love is essential. Jump ahead to verse 8 through 13. We see here that love is eternal. Love is eternal. Let's read those verses again. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now these verses, when it talks about the perfect, it's talking about the time of completion when Christ returns. And in that day, for God's people, there will no longer be a need for spiritual gifts. Right? In this life, we still need them. There's a lot we don't have. There's a lot we don't know. God reveals to his people enough truth about himself that we can be saved, enough truth that we can know him truly, but we don't know fully. So he gives us spiritual gifts and insights, and these serve as a foretaste, an appetizer to what we will one day enjoy more fully, more completely in his presence forever. And on that day when God's people dwell with God, faith will give way to sight. And we will see reality, the reality of our own lives, the reality of human history, the history of God's people. We will see this more truly and with a fuller perspective than we can ever see it now in this life. And I, I think we'll be spending a lot of time saying, ah, Lord, that's what you were doing. That was your purposes. Now I can see the wisdom of it. I couldn't see it before. It was clouded. It was dark. Now I can see. Paul uses this analogy of coming of age, just as childhood and childish thinking give way to mature adulthood. So this age of spiritual gifts and partial knowledge will give way to a more complete heavenly knowledge when Jesus returns. It's interesting there, verse 13, it says, Even faith, which is crucial now, is not eternal in the same way that love is. Because faith is, is really something for this age, right? We, we, we uh, come to faith by hearing the word of Christ. But in that day, we will see Christ. Faith gives way to sight. And hope, what is hope? Well, hope is what we hold on to today. We are holding on to a certain and sure promised future. It still lies out ahead of us. Hope isn't just like, I hope something good happens. Hope is a certainty in the Bible that God will keep his promises and that everything good that we hope for in Christ will come to realization. That's our hope. But that will give way, the hope of a promised future will give way to the enjoyment, the experience in the present of all that God has promised. It will be the present experience of fullness of joy when we are with Christ. So faith and hope will not remain unchanged. But what will remain, what will continue, what will just increase is love. God is 
love. And so love is eternal. Spiritual gifts won't be needed anymore. They will pass away. But love will never pass away. In the resurrection life, our experience, our enjoyment of God's love will only increase. Anselm, a theologian from about a millennia ago, he had a theory about the endless joy we'll experience in heaven. How is it that we'll experience abounding and superabounding and overflowing joy constantly? Well, he thought that part of this was rooted in the fact that in heaven we will have a perfect love for others. And when we on that day love others completely, then we will be as happy as they are for every joy in their heart. And our increasing joy in our own lives will also then be shared with all the saints who now have a perfect love for us. And so our loves will pile up exponentially and eternally. Love never ends. Love is essential. Love is eternal. So we should value it and seek it. We should get our eyes off of ourselves and our small ambitions for greater abilities, better approval ratings, and put on love. This is what God values, and this is what lasts. That's the value of love. What about the character of love? What does this look like? What does it look like to be this kind of person? Well, we read these familiar verses. Uh, I think it's worth noting here, verses 4 to 7, in the Greek, every item on this list is a verb. Sometimes it's hard to know how to capture that in the English. But love here is, is not just a concept. It's a way of life. Biblical love is certainly not just a feeling, which is maybe how we most naturally think about it in our culture. But love is to be lived out. It starts on the inside, but it doesn't stay there. It comes out in the way that we treat others. It's a verb. It's an action. It does certain things and it doesn't do other things. Look at those verses again. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Trying to think about how to sum up all of these truths that are stacked up, all these attributes of love, all these actions of love. The best I could do is just love is selfless. Love is selfless, like I said in our main point. But even that could just sound like, well, just don't think too much about yourself. What we mean here by selfless, though, is that it is positively aimed at the good of others. Love is aimed at the good of others. Biblical love is directed toward others. It cannot be practiced alone, cut off from God, Cut off from others, it is lived out in relationship, especially in church community, which is the context here. So let's consider each of these phrases in turn. Some will spend more time on than others. But I want to at least mention them all. First, love is patient. Love is patient. Patience, maybe we think about small inconveniences, like sitting in traffic, waiting for kids to get their shoes on waiting for someone to finish their sentence. Come on, say it. I know what you're going to say. Just say it. What do you think about things like that? It includes that, certainly, but much more patience puts up with long-term trials and suffering for the good of others. You could also translate this as love forbears. It puts up with other people and their shortcomings and their sins and their weaknesses and all the ways those things negatively impact me. It holds back from unleashing and doling out the punishment I think they deserve in that moment. Love is patient. Love is kind. If, if patience is more passive, kindness is active. Patience holds back from giving someone what they deserve. Kindness gives them good things even when they don't deserve it. Love forbears, but love requires more than forbearance, right? If someone can say of you, you know, he never spoke an unkind word to me. Well, that's meaningful only if you're actually speaking words to them. 
Silence isn't enough. To be loved well, you must speak words of love. You must do loving things for the good of others. Next, Paul turns and examines the many things that love does not do. He says love does not envy. How do you respond when you see other people who are gifted? Really gifted? Ways that you wish you were? Or when you see people enjoying good things that you would love to have? If you cannot rejoice with them or celebrate in their gifts, in their strengths, because it's what you want for yourself, then what you're dealing with is a love problem. You are struggling to love them. Your love for yourself is outpacing your love for them. That's what envy comes from. It says love does not boast. Love is not arrogant. Envy says, I want what you have. Boasting says, ah, I have what you want. Look what I have. Look at this. When we're like this, when we're puffed up, we are wrongly thinking that our abilities came from ourselves. We must be thinking that. That our abilities came from ourselves, not from God. And if they came from us, well, it's not a stretch to say then they exist for my purposes. To show off my greatness. When I'm boasting in my greatness, whether that's out loud or maybe more often just in my own thoughts, one thing is sure, I'm not thinking about you and what you need. Love does not boast. Love is not arrogant. Love is not rude. The word here, rude, can also be translated dishonorable. Love is not dishonorable. Love is not indecent. These words, this semantic range of this word includes treating someone as lesser in various ways. It's the same word that's used back in chapter 7 when Paul talks about a man who is not behaving properly toward his betrothed. Or in chapter 11, same root word when he talks about the rich mistreating the poor at the Lord's Supper. It's translated there, humiliate. You humiliate those who have nothing. Right? Love doesn't do this. Love doesn't try to bring people down. Love does not demean others. It doesn't call them names. It doesn't treat them as beneath you. Love does not use people. When that's the lens through which I view others, and I'm thinking, how can they serve my needs? How can they make me happy? How can they help me get what I want? Then love is certainly out of the picture. Next, he says, love doesn't insist on its own way. A more direct translation you may have, if you have another translation, love is not self Seeking, when my behavior and decisions are based only or primarily on what's best for me, there's no room left to prioritize others, to seek their good, to love them. I think today, uh, most popular counsel will focus on caring for yourself, prioritizing your own needs, and, and there can be some wisdom in this. We aren't called to, to run towards harm. But if I treat myself as the top priority, or the only priority, then I am ruling out from the start even the possibility of love, which is not self-seeking. Next he says, love is not irritable. It can also be translated, love is not easily angered. Are you difficult to offend? Or do you have a short fuse? Maybe you're friendly most of the time, to most people. But there's certain people, certain places, certain circumstances that set you off. And you get so angry, or maybe you don't say angry, maybe you say frustrated, annoyed. And you feel justified in venting. Could be in public that it happens sometimes, probably more often in the privacy of your home with people closest to you. Regardless of how justified your anger may feel, in those moments, you are choosing something other than love. A loving person is slow to anger. A loving person is hard to offend. Next, love is not resentful. 
It keeps no record of wrongs. It's so natural to keep score. And it's the wrongs that other people do to me, not the wrongs I do, but the wrongs they do to me that tend to be etched into my memory. Now, you might have been sinned against in really evil ways that remain in your memory. And you have memories you wish you could get rid of, but you can't. That's not your fault. That's not what this is talking about. It's also not talking about, well, just ignore the past. Pretend like it didn't exist. Never happened. No, we're not called to do that. There are certainly times where we're not able to trust someone because they have proven themselves untrustworthy. This also doesn't mean that it's wrong to desire justice for the serious wrongs that have been done against us or against others. No, this, this phrase is not about those things. It's about resentment. It's about bitter and a, a, an unmerciful attitude towards other people where we, we hold on to bitterness, we hold on to personal grudges, and we long for justice. And more than justice, we want to see them destroyed. We wish evil on them, and if we could, we would love to be the one to bring it about. Jesus tells us, famously, to love our enemies. Love our enemies. Now, that does not mean minimizing or excusing their evil or giving up on justice. But it does mean that I personally stand ready to celebrate their repentance If possible, so far as it depends on me, I'm ready to live at peace with them. I think that's a good litmus test. How would I respond if that other person who sinned against me turned from their sin and came to saving faith in Christ? Could I celebrate that? Could I celebrate it if Jesus bore their sins just the way he's borne mine? Could I celebrate if he gave them a glorious future they don't deserve just as he's done for me? Or would I rather see them get what they deserve? Love keeps no record of wrongs. Will I choose to fixate on their sins? Will I willingly replay and recount their sins and be eager to tell of how they've wronged me? Love doesn't keep score like this. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing. You say, well, why would anyone rejoice at wrongdoing? Well, I can think of a few reasons. I think one is that we see others doing wrong, it might make us feel better about ourselves. And isn't it human nature to be drawn to salacious gossip? There is a whole gossip industry in addition to all the private gossip that happens. There's a reason that scandals make headlines. But love does not rejoice in evil. I think another reason we might feel like we could rejoice in evil is because today there's pressure to rejoice when people live in ways that God says are wrong. And we're told that in order to love, we must celebrate, we must affirm. But God is the one who defines what is truly loving. He's the one who sets the boundaries. He tells us the direction and shape that true love must take. And love can never mean unconditional affirmation of all behaviors. Because what is evil is also harmful. Right? We we, we never should get the idea in our minds that we have to choose between loving God and loving neighbor. Like I want to love God, but I just love my neighbor too much. No, no, no. What is Wrong, a sin against God, is also harmful for those who sin. So we oppose sinful lifestyles, not because we don't love people, but because we do love them. And love drives us to oppose behaviors that bring harm to everyone, including the guilty parties. Love won't allow us to cover up evil and abuse because we know that would not be good for victims nor would it be good for offenders. Love does not rejoice in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. When others around us live in the truth and they are just prospering and thriving, it's love that allows us to rejoice. 
in the truth. And when the truth take roots, takes root in hearts and lives and they're bearing much spiritual fruit, we don't have to be threatened, not if we love them, because we're not in competition. We can celebrate their faithfulness and their growth. And when other gospel preaching churches prosper, maybe even prosper in ways that we don't, we can rejoice. Love compels us to celebrate their victories. Verse 7, very poetically, concludes with four phrases. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. It seems like the first and the last phrases go together and then the middle two go together. Kind of an A, B, B, A. First and last pretty much saying the same thing. The middle two pretty much saying the same thing. So those middle two first. Love believes all things and hopes all things. Love does not default to suspicion. Now we don't need to be foolish or naive, but suspicion is not loving. Love's instinct is to believe the best as far as the truth allows. So when another person does something and their motives are not entirely clear, maybe they seem clear to you, but objectively speaking, or as you talk to others about what to do about a situation, it's not clear. It's not immediately obvious or transparent what the motives are especially when that other person is a fellow Christian. Love starts with the most charitable interpretation. Love is quick to see evidence of God's grace in another person. Quick to show empathy, trying to put yourself in their shoes, imagining how their own personal experiences and hardships and trials could be affecting their behavior. Love believes all things, hopes all things. It doesn't write people off as hopeless. As Christians, if there's another person and they're still alive, we don't say, I know they'll never change. They're never going to repent. Love holds out hope. Ultimately, hope and belief are not grounded in that other person, but in a trustworthy God who has power to change people in this life and who is just to make all things right in the end. And I think it's actually this trust in God's justice that enables us to live out the first and last phrases here. Love bears all things and endures all things. Bearing all things, enduring all things, a tough pill to swallow, especially if you've had other people do horrible things unspeakable things to you. How am I supposed to endure that? Paul says in uh, Romans 12, he's basically quoting Jesus, and he says, bless those who persecute you, right? Gets that from the Sermon on the Mount. Well, does that mean then we give up on justice? And we say, no, we don't need justice. We just choose forgiveness instead. No, certainly not. Paul goes on to explain there, he says, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. You see the connection there? You see how a a confidence in God and his eternal justice frees us up to love when we know that God in the end will, will take care of righting every wrong? We don't have to settle every score now in this life. It's not up to us. We are free to love everyone, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ, but even our enemies. We can bear up under mistreatment. We can endure the weaknesses and the sins and all the ways they affect us. We can persevere in love. We see the character of love. And we ask ourselves as we work through them, well, how how am I doing? How do I measure up? Well, I think many of us can say, not all that well. Not great in certain areas. Well, we don't despair because to be a Christian means we, we come to the realization that we don't measure up. We, we realize that the, the justice that we all long for, the justice we all hope in, is also the justice that will crush us if left to ourselves, if left in our own sin, and if, if left with our unloving hearts toward God and others. And so we rest our hope in 
God's love for us in Christ. In the old hymn, uh, I Hear the Words of Love, says, it's his love, not mine, that is our resting place. That is our bedrock of assurance. This is our hope. This is how we have confidence in life and even in death. God is love, and he has demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you've not received that love, today's the day to put your trust in Christ. To turn away, acknowledge your own sin, turn away from it, and receive what Christ has done in dying in the place of sinners and rising again to new life. I'd love to talk to you more about what that means. We're going to see a picture of that in baptism this morning. That's what you need to receive God's love. And it's only when you've received this love that you can live out this love as the Spirit of God sets our minds on Christ and we are filled up with God's love toward us and we are changed from natural selfishness. Then we're able to love others, to desire their good and then do them good. So, Christian, if you want to live like this, what do you do? You could remember these specific phrases and seek to apply them to life. This is rich passage for meditation. That's a good step. But I think even more than remembering the information, remembering the different phrases, we need to be shaped by Christ, don't we? We need our minds to be reminded and we need our hearts to be moved. If you want to love others, dwell on this. Ask this question. How has God treated me in Christ. Because when you remember this, when you really not just say, yes, I do remember that, but when you're moved by it, when you're captivated again by it, then you're motivated to treat other people in the same way. I mean, aren't these verses a good description of how God has loved us in Christ? You can pretty much replace love with God or with Jesus. Jesus is patient and kind, isn't he? Because of his death, he spared us from the punishment we deserve. But he didn't stop there. He didn't just bring us back to neutral. He didn't just take us out of the red to a zero balance. He showered us with God's favor that we don't deserve. He is patient and he is so kind. Jesus is not irritable. He's not easily angered, even if sometimes you suspect that he is. Remember when Jesus, just one example, when he and his disciples We're looking to go to a desolate place. They wanted a retreat. They wanted to get away. They wanted to be alone. But people saw them. Crowds started to gather. Eventually the crowd is huge. And Jesus sees the crowd. Says he had compassion on them. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Even on earth when Jesus experienced his human weakness. This was his heart of compassion. How much more now as he reigns in glory? Is he eager to show compassion to us? He was not irritated by those crowds. He is not irritated by you and your neediness. Jesus did not insist on his own way. He was the furthest thing from self-seeking. He demonstrated God's love by giving up his rights, his rights to glory, his rights to respect. And in love, he lowered himself to death, even death on a shameful cross reserved for wicked criminals. Jesus is not resentful. He willingly died for people who had rejected him. And we see no indication that he had any regrets or any second thoughts. He never says, ah, look what you made me do. Look at the mess you made and how much it cost me. No, he stands eager to forgive. Even when he was back on the cross, he stood eager to forgive. He said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. And by his death, he purchased the forgiveness of everyone who had ever put their faith in him. If you are trusting in him, you can be sure that in him there is no resentment. There is no record keeping of your wrongs. The cross has put those things away once and for all. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions 
from us. Is this the love you've received? And if you've received it, has this love begun to change you? Whatever other priorities or goals or aims you have right now that you're pursuing, other abilities that you're after, look this morning at what's important to God. He does not call us to impress. He does call us to love. Let's make that our aim, to love like this. Right? When, you, when you're considering, maybe even with the help of others, how am I doing spiritually? Am I faithful? A big part of your answer to that question should depend on how are you loving? Are you loving well? Let's make this our aim. Let's make this our prayer that the love of God we have in Christ would so captivate us as we spend time with him daily, as we spend time in community, as we gather Lord's Day after Lord's Day, may it so captivate us that it becomes pervasive in our hearts, in our lives, and in our church. Let's pray. Father, we see our unloving attitudes, our unloving hearts, and we confess this to you, and we put our hope again in the love that you have shown us and showered on us in Christ. We don't have another hope. We can't be good enough. We can't love well enough. Our hope is in your love. And we do pray that we would be at peace, filled with assurance and hope because of that love and freed up to love others well. Lord, would you do a work in our hearts and in our church that love becomes a frequent, common characteristic of our lives, of our interactions, of our relationships. We can't do this on our own. We need your help. So we pray for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's because of God's love for us that we have this certain hope of forgiveness and of new life. And the scriptures tell us that it's in baptism that we publicly identify with this Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has loved us and laid down his life for us. And it's such an expectation. It's not just one option among others, but it's such an expectation for Christians that Paul writes in Romans 6 to a church that he's actually never even met at that point. And he talks about how they have been baptized and how that baptism has pictured their death to sin with Christ and their resurrection to live a new life. So when we enter the waters of baptism, we are publicly proclaiming, I belong to Christ. By faith, I am one with him. I am dead to sin, and now I am spiritually alive, and I look forward to that future resurrection because of what Christ has done for me. So Jenna Rose is going to come this morning. She's going to share with us a summary of how she came to understand this good news, and then she'll be baptized. If you've not been baptized and you have trusted in Christ, talk to me, talk to another elder. Uh, we'd love to help shepherd you toward this act of obedience and this joy. Jenna, how have you um, come to saving faith in Christ? What is it that brings you to be baptized this morning? You're doing great, but the mic's not on. And we really want to hear what you're saying. So we'll make sure we get it here. All right. Thanks, Jenna. Okay. I grew up in a Christian home with parents who have faithfully shared the gospel with me since I can remember. Some of my earliest memories are of my mom and dad reading me the Jesus Storybook Bible or singing Jesus Loves Me at bedtime. They took me to a good Christian um, local church every Sunday where they taught me the same message I heard at home. From the time that I was a little girl, I thought myself pretty solid on the basics of Christianity and would probably have told you something like this if asked to explain the gospel. God had created the world, we sinned, Jesus died for us, and all we have to do is pray and ask Jesus into our hearts and we can go to heaven. In accordance with this understanding of the gospel, I had asked Jesus into my heart multiple times to please various people and to just have a general fire insurance against hell. 
I assumed there, that was all there was to it, and lived my life in pride and selfishness. I did not understand the gravity of my sin, how it penetrated every thought, every word, and every action I did, how I was incapable of doing anything good, how I was a slave to sin and rebelling against God at every point. I saw God as more of a kind grandparent who overlooks a few flaws and loves me anyway, instead of the king of the universe who in his justice condemns us to hell in eternal separation from, our, from him for our sin. I began to understand this around fifth grade and tried reciting the prayer again in a desperate attempt to atone for my sins. I found that a simple recitation of words wasn't enough and began to give my life a or live my life as holy as possible, hoping that somehow my good deeds would outweigh my sin. I didn't tell my parents or anyone else how I was feeling, not knowing whether I was saved or, or not, or something in between. One Sunday I was sitting in church, and an older friend was baptized and shared his testimony. He talked how he, about how he struggled with assurance of salvation in middle school and didn't know exactly when he became a Christian, but was sure of his salvation because of his faith in Jesus. I was shocked, <laughs> first, because I wasn't the first person to experience this, and second, that all you have to do to be saved is have faith in Jesus' sacrifice on your behalf. It was that simple. I was able to talk to my parents after that, and they helped me understand the true gospel, that though we are sinners, Christ gave his life for us on the cross, rising on the third day, proving that death was defeated so that we could take on his righteousness and adopt and be adopted as his children. I began to understand what Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. One sermon I heard explained that if you want to believe, God will give you the faith to trust in him. So I started praying for faith. I don't know exactly when I became a Christian, but looking back, I can see how my life began to change around the time I was going into eighth grade. God gave me a love for people, which radically changed my relationships with my family and friends. I began to rely on God to help me in my daily life and began wanting to praise him for his incredible character. Even in these difficult past few years, God has kept me, and I'm ready to commit my life to loving and serving him and his people. I'm here to be baptized today to publicly identify with Christ in his death and resurrection and promise to walk with him for the rest of my life. Amen. Amen. Let's go. We're going to sing and celebrate uh, the gospel truths that we've been hearing about. We're going to sing the first four verses of our song. We're going to stand to sing, and then we'll sit down for Jenna's baptism. We'll stand again and sing the final verse. So let's stand and celebrate together. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains the dying thief rejoice to see that fountain in his day and there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away, wash all my sins away, wash all my sins away. 
By faith I saw the stream, thy flowing wounds supply, redeeming love has been my theme, and shall be till I die, and shall silent in the grave then in a nobler sweeter song I'll sing thy power to save I'll sing thy power to save I'll thy power to save. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. Please be seated. As we prepare to baptize you, I need to ask you two questions. First, do you make profession of repentance towards God and of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? I do. And do you promise, by God's grace, to follow Jesus forever in the fellowship of his church? I do. Then in light of your profession and your promise, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please stand and sing the last verse with us. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransom church of God be saved to sin no more be saved to sin no more be saved to sin no more till all the ransom church of God be saved to sin no more now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. You're dismissed.